this glorious city on Puget Sound in the Pacific Northwest, the city of Seattle. This afternoon, we fit the final piece into the puzzle of the 1987 Final Four as the Iowa Hawkeyes from the Big Ten take on the UNLV Running Rebels. The winner of this game will advance to meet Indiana in New Orleans in the semifinal game next week. They will join Syracuse, Providence, and Indiana in the Final Four. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Seattle. I'm Vern Lundquist. We think we have a matchup that promises to be every bit as exhilarating and exciting as that LSU-Indiana game you just witnessed. In UNLV, we have a team ranked number one for most of the year, and in the Iowa Hawkeyes, a team that was ranked number one when the Runner Rebels weren't. I'm working with Billy Cunningham again today, and Bill, we've all heard about the pressure defense of Iowa. We've heard a tremendous amount about the offense of UNLV. What about their defensive team? Well, UNLV's defense is just tenacious. And when you talk to Jerry Tarkanian about his defense, you get that big smile and that pride factor. And you know one thing, he wants to use 94 feet of this basketball court with his defense. He has all five players playing that tenacious defense, and they have caused their opponents over 19 turnovers per game this year. Matter of fact, Dr. Tom Davis, the Iowa coach, said this is as quick a defensive unit, talking about UNLV, as he has ever seen in college basketball. Now, Iowa comes in averaging a lot of points per game up in the 80s. They looked a little sluggish in their semifinal win here over Wyoming. Yeah, Vern, they did. They just weren't as sharp as they have been. And I think there's two key people that have to do the job for this ball club today. I think it's Roy Marple. He did not play well offensively against Oklahoma, and they're going to need him today. And they're going to need those the leadership from Brad Lowhouse. So it's Iowa against UNLV, and the winner goes to New Orleans. They have a long way to travel from Seattle down to the Gulf Coast. CBS Sports presents the NCAA Basketball Championship. Today's regional final game from Seattle is sponsored by the Heartbeat of America, today's Chevrolet. Has come in with a 30 and 4 season record. They defeated Santa Clara, UTEP, and Oklahoma to get to this spot. And the Running Rebels are 36 and 1. They defeated Idaho State, Kansas State, and Wyoming. Now let's go to our public address announcer, Rod Belcher, to meet the starting lineups. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Kingdom for this afternoon's West Regional Final between the University of Iowa Hawkeyes and the Running Rebels of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Now, let's meet the starting lineups. For Iowa, at forward, a seven-foot senior from Glendale, Arizona, number 54, Brad Lowhouse. For UNLV, at forward, a 6'7 junior from Rain, Louisiana, number 23, Gerald Patio. For Iowa, at forward, a 6'5 sophomore from Flint, Michigan, number 23, Roy Marble. For UNLV, at forward, a 6'9 senior from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, number 35, Armin Gilliam. For Iowa, at center, a 6'7 senior from San Bernardino, California, number three, Gary Wright. For UNLV, at center, a 6'8 junior from Detroit, Michigan, number 44, Jarvis Bassnight. For Iowa, at guard, a 6'2 sophomore from Detroit, Michigan, number 10, B.J. Armstrong. For UNLV at guard, a six-foot senior from San Pedro, California, number 10, Mark Wade. For Iowa at guard, a 6'5 senior from Springfield, Illinois, number 35, Kevin Gamble. And for UNLV at guard, a 6'2 senior from Las Vegas, Nevada, number 13, Freddie Banks. And introducing the head coaches for Iowa in his first season, Dr. Tom Davis, for UNLV in his 14th season, Jerry Tarkanian. Last to the quartet, about to be determined, the final four, which will head for New Orleans in a week. We'll be back in Seattle in just a moment. expected here in the Kingdom in Seattle this afternoon. The officiating crew, Joey Sylvester of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, the referee, Don Rutledge of Windermere, Florida, and Louis Griel of Washington, D.C. 
Uh, the umpires and the official, or the alternate rather, Willis McJunk from the Spokane. The only time the two teams met was back in 78. It was an 85-84 game. UNLV goes right to left, and the Iowa Hawkeyes in the opposite direction. Joey Sylvester getting ready to tip it up. The winner of this one plays Indiana next Saturday in New Orleans as the Hoosiers came from behind to nip LSU by one. Running Rebels ball. Freddie Banks quickly takes the jumper. Too long. Rebound. Banks gets it. And Mark Wade, who set a single-season NCAA record with assist, he now has 376. And the rebound on the line. Banks and the Iowa's ball. Quickly, that uh, pressure, de or the, uh, pressure defense of UNLV, Bill. That's right. We see Mark Wade right away picking up B.J. Armstrong. There's a screen. Got to talk on those screens. Gary Wright hit the screen. This is Lowhouse, the seven-footer, who likes to play on occasion from the perimeter. He's guarded by Baznight. They get Baznight out away from the basket. Well, when you play against this type of pressure, you have to have good patience and look for backdoor situations. Nice pass by Marble underneath, and Gary Wright gets the first basket of the game. We see the trap. No, it's just showing the trap at this point. Mark Wade, baseball pass. The first turnover of the game. Gary Wright returns the honor. Looks like Johnny Bench throwing to second. Armstrong lays it off to Marble. Off the glass, short. Lowhouse with the follow. Well, Tom Davis was very concerned about his team coming out and being a little nervous in this basketball game, but we don't see that right off the bat. We have mentioned the two men you mentioned at the outset, Lowhouse and Marble. And they've got the first two baskets as Iowa takes a 4-0 edge. Wade left side. Freddie Banks for three. Got it. Due to operating difficulties, there has been an interruption to the sound. We shall continue with the picture portion until this difficulty is cleared. Strong, that's for two. Well, after that shot he hit again, 
it in the last ball game against Wyoming. He's got to feel awfully confident. Excuse me, Oklahoma. There's the steal by Iowa. Gamble gets it. Two more. And it's a 12-7 Iowa lead. Understand we're having some audio problems. We're working on that. Hope to get them corrected shortly. 16-33 to go in the first half. A 12-7 Iowa lead. Reach-in foul. Gamble gets caught. Now, Gamble has been the big playmaker of this ball club all year. We see this steal and pulling up for that little jump shot. It was Gamble, the hero of the win over Oklahoma, as we said. With that three-pointer, two seconds left in overtime. From three, Patio doesn't get it. Foul underneath. Sends Tarkanian into agony. Well, Gerald Patio has really been struggling from the field. In the last ball game, he was two for nine and one for seven from that three-point area. And Coach Tarkanian is very concerned. And if he doesn't hit a shot or two, I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, Graham, Gary Graham get in this ball game. Armstrong guarded by Mark Wade. Armstrong's doing an excellent job so far against that pressure, getting his team into this set offense. Baz Knight goes for the steal. Low house controls for Iowa. And Wright takes the jumper, gets it. 14 to 7. Well, that's something Wright's not known for. You expect him to be looking, driving to the hoop and getting to the offensive boards. Hawkeyes are 6 of 8 from the field. But well, we see Gamble is just backing off into the lane area, ready to give the help inside on, on Gilliam. There's the lob to Gilliam. He gets the second effort to put back. UNLV field goal by 35, Armand Gilliam. Brad Lowhouse is an injury timeout. We'll look at uh, Iowa underneath. Now, here's that pass inside. You see Kevin Gamble looking to come back and help it. Not quick enough. Two changes for Iowa entering. Ed Horton comes into the lineup. Now, Lowhouse had his eye scratched when he was elbowed by a teammate on Wednesday and had 10 stitches in his right eye. I don't know if that's the problem or if it's the left eye this time. But Ed Horton has taken his spot. Well, that'll be a big loss for this ball club if he's not able to get back into the game. Al Lorenzen also went for the Hawkeyes. B.J. Armstrong gets two more. 4-16 to 9. Now, that's a great strength of Armstrong, being able to push the ball the length of the court. Benny Banks, too strong. Big rebound. Roy Marble, the sophomore, out of Flint, Michigan. Hawkeyes are 7 of 9 from the field, Bill. Well, so far, they've been able to get into their set offense very easily. Their trapping defense has been effective for them. They're playing their kind of game. They caught Marble throwing an elbow. That's okay, now, now what we've seen now, the only negative thing is Roy Marble has tried to force things now offensively twice. Last time he commit, committed a turnover, and now he's called for a charging foul. Another substitution now. Fiery Jeff Moe is in the lineup, and... Gamble, Gamble is out, and number 11, Michael Reeves, comes in. Very comparable to John Thompson at Georgetown, Dean Smith at North Carolina, how Dr. Tom Davis uses his bench. Oh, yeah, he, all through the game. He wants to wear you out. Now we see where Jeff Moe is playing defensively. Patio misses his first two three-pointers. Wade comes over, controls for UNLV. That's not what Tarkanian wanted. He was hoping for a quick start from Patio. That's 0 for 3 for Patio. 0 for 4. And that's got to concern Tarkanian. Huh. It's, you've got to concern him, and Fadio is just struggling so much if he almost becomes a mental block with you. You try to force things. You don't finish your shot. And once a player starts thinking, it's disaster. Michael Reeves on a great feed, and Iowa has doubled the score. In the backcourt, Al Lorenzen draws the foul. Well, this Iowa team, which was very sluggish, I thought, in their last game against Oklahoma at the offensive end of the court, are moving the basketball. What a great pass. Timeout. 14-26 to go first half. Hawkeyes with a big start. It doesn't matter where. I looked up and there was no more ceiling, no more roof. It doesn't matter when. We didn't know where to turn. The all-state catastrophe. He was concerned about Armand Gilliam. You see right here in the picture, he'll end up with four players surrounding him on the inside of that play. That what they're doing defensively is they're saying, well, Wade, Patio, prove it to us. Can you hit that outside shot? And so far, they have not been able to do that. 
Look at Moe and Marble back. Now we're back to live action, and the rebounding edge is huge for Iowa so far, 13 to 6. I would think that Coach Tarkanian might end up putting Mark Wade on a different location on the court, and not at the top of the key. He is now on the wing, so they might be able to get into something offensively. There's Wade. Gets it, and that's a three-pointer. That's a big shot. Well, one of the reasons you don't play Mark Wade with much pressure is last year, <laughs> the whole season, as a starting guard, he only shot the ball 67 times. That's in 38 games. The other night, he was one for two, and it's important for him to get off to a start because they'll give him that shot all day. You know, not many coaches, when you get to a timeout, have to tell a player you've got to shoot the basketball. Five-second violation. Lorenzen and Wade... And that's a turnover. Third Iowa turnover of the first half. 13.45 to go before halftime. Foul. Jeff Lowe. Now, watch the switch on the baseline defensively. They switch, and how do you switch? You have to communicate, talk to each other, and make sure that you, if you don't talk on the defensive end on that, that court, you end up with two players, in most cases, leaving playing one player and someone wide open for a shot. Mark Wade at the free throw line into the corner for Freddie Banks for three. That's short. Banks gets his own rebound. Up, no foul. No call. Gilliam gets the basket. No, I don't think they're going to allow the basket, Fern. But I, I don't know if he... It looked like he was getting fouled while he was in the motion going to the basket. Let's take a look. Now we see the drive by Banks to the hole. Ooh, that hurt. And now Gilliam just comes in. The hammer takes it and powers it up to the basket. He did get fouled, though. Mo got him before he left the floor. That's the fifth Iowa team foul. And two fouls on Jeff Mo. And getting close to the bonus. Now the inbound pressure applied. And Ed Horton almost took it away from Gilliam. The hammer just took it away from him. 18-16, Rebels on a run. They've scored seven unanswered points. Now Armstrong joined by Lorenzen. B.J. Armstrong back in. Both teams are, are street ball clubs. We saw in the, the last game when Iowa uh, played Oklahoma, they had a string of 19 unanswered basketball points. And then we saw in, the, in UNLV had that time, uh, type of streak against Wyoming in the second half. Oh, excellent pass from Lorenzen. And a shooting foul. Now, I want to ask you a question, Vern, on this play. Right. How would you like to arm wrestle this gentleman right here? <laughs> arm in the hammer. Boom! <laughs> Motto there is stay away from Petaluma. <laughs> Gilliam got the foul, and Kevin Gamble will be at the line. Gamble, the senior from Springfield, Illinois. You know, when a team traps and a team has no success against it, it's the snowball effect. You start thinking, you become tentative when you're looking to attack it. You're afraid to make a mistake. And when that happens, a team like Iowa really can get you. But it also is the same thing when it's with a team like uh, UNLV because of their great man-to-man -man defensive pressure. No problem with the pressure defense this time as Wade gets it across. Well, the theory of Tom Davis with his trap is one pass and done. When you make, after that first pass is made by the team attacking the trap, they'll just back off, go to their 1-2-2 two, two, two zone trap, uh, but, excuse me, zone, or they'll go to their man-to-man. -man. Gilliam with a turnaround. He's got six points. Gary Graham has also come in now for UNLV. He's in the backboard following B.J. Armstrong. And Armstrong pushes it up the floor. Watch the pressure on the guards here. Yeah, and you've got to remember, Baz Knight is the center, and he's up there putting that type of pressure on. Timeout has been called by Jerry Tarkanian's running Rebels. They trail by two. UNLV has accomplished in postseason play the margin of difference 35 34 a couple of 25 19 and 14 they haven't been tested as a matter of fact the last time 
They won by less than 10, was on February 7th of this year, when they defeated San Jose State 83-74. Now, while we were away, there was this discussion that took place at the scoring table. There was a UNLV basket, which was inadvertently given. So here is the correct score, not 2018, but 20 to 16. I knew we'd have a lot of points, but somebody tossed in a couple of extra on us. So the correct score now, and it was that discussion which righted it during the timeout. It's 20 to 16, Iowa leads. But well, we see a little trapping defense right here by the, the Rebels going to a half-court trap. Back it goes to Kevin Gamble. Iowa has Gamble, Armstrong, Lowhouse. Wright and Marble on the floor. Marble has not scored yet. Well, it's good to see there was nothing serious with Brad Lowhouse. Got his eye check, got him back in, turnover. That's the fourth Iowa turnover. That's a great move by Jerry Tarkani, and he comes out of a timeout. They're preparing, Tom Davis is preparing his team for a man-to-man, -man and they go to that trap. Saw an example of the outstanding rebounding strength of Iowa with that Roy Marble grab, and underneath, Marble, the recipient of a heck of a blow and a foul call. That's Eldridge Hudson who is in the game now. Arguing the call, but there'd be no argument. All he did was grab him and try to throw him to the floor. <laughs> now watch this, he's just grabbing Marble, trying to throw him to the floor. No foul, not at all. Reverse layup, Roy Marble. What a play. It didn't appear that he even had any vision of the basket when he went up for that shot. Just a sophomore out of Flint, Michigan. Marble has been averaging 15 points per game this year. That was over the rim. I thought it was. Arcanian thought it was. And Lowhouse gets credit for the basket. That was over the cylinder, Vern. The tip, Baznight controls for UNLV. Mark Wade. Now I was going to his zone. And the three-point basket again, this time from Gary Graham, number 32. This is a UNLV team which for the year, coming into today's game, had shot three-pointers 716 times. 716. Right. Rebound, Marble. Give you a little perspective, the Notre Dame team that uh, Bill and I saw last week had a hundred efforts for the season. Well, we see they're hurting so far the Rebels on the offensive boards. Cannot allow that to happen in a game like this. Not a good rebounding UNLV team. Maybe their biggest weakness. That was a strong move to the middle by Gamble. 26-19, 10-25. Winner of this game meets Indiana next Saturday on CBS in the Final Four. And Providence plays Syracuse and the other two members of the quartet. There's another three-pointer. Armin Gilliam. He's got eight. He had 38 and 13 rebounds in the win over Wyoming Friday night. Gamble. Good Graham. Good call. Graham ends up pushing off inside. Now watch this strong move to the basket. No help for, Gilli for Gilliam on that power move. And for Iowa, number 20, now watch Lowhouse. This is something this team practices. Going baseline, and he beats his man to the baseline, is able to tip in that missed shot. Roy Marble goes to the line. Largest lead of the game has been nine by Iowa at 18 to nine. So far, the running Rebels have not been reacting and responding to each other as well as Jerry Tarkanian would like to see them defensively. They're not in sync. We saw in that replay when Gamble took it strong to the basket, he, someone has got to come back and give that defensive help. They're not reacting well at this point. Last fouls on Gary Wright, his first. 16 fouls on Iowa, seven on UNLV, so we'll shoot bonus free throws from now on through the half. David Willard's in there in the middle. Three points. Scramble and Wade comes up for it. David Willard, number 40 for UNLV. It appears UNLV's approach to this game is, you shoot the ball, and Armin, you go get it. <laughs> he just did. Huh? He has 
that ability. He's so big and wide. When he gets in there, he makes that space for himself. Gilliam, excuse me, Bill. But he gets to the offensive boards before the shot is taken. How about the bounce pass from Gary Wright? How about the bounce pass? Well, it's the bounce pass, but I would be very upset if I'm Jerry Tarkanian. Number one, he wants to look to overplay defensively. Then we'll see that. But, oh, there was an overplay. He just lost his man. Lack of communication there with David Willard. And he goes for the basket, but you see no one reacted to each other defensively there. And for Jerry Tarkanian's team to be effective in the half-court bases with their man-to-man -man defense, they have to respond to each other. Rebound, David Willard, UNLV with a chance to cut the lead to three or two. Freddie Banks. taking that ball with one hand. When you're in the position he was on the baseline, right near the basket, you want to take it with two hands and power it to the basket. Looking to draw the foul, number one, but a chance to get that three-point play. When you go up with the one hand, your chances are very slim. And Wright doesn't want to be at the free throw line. He's hitting only 50% for the year. Gillian with 10, low house has eight so far. 28, 25, 8.59 to go first half. One of two, that's his season average. Now Lowhouse guarding Willard, who's inbounding the ball, he gets it over the top. And Wade forces the ball in the corner. Graham, good! That's two. I'll tell you, Coach Sarkanian talked about how he hadn't seen a trap in, so, in several years. Well, they saw one last year against Stanford when, when Tom Davis was coaching Stanford and they had problems. But when you hit a couple of shots like that, that really gets the adrenaline flowing. The players can't wait to see a trap. Michael Reeves takes it to the free throw line. Blocking foul. Oh, no. They're going to say offensive foul. Now, that's the way Jerry Tarkanian wants his team to play defensively. One man was beaten defensively, but there was someone coming over to give that help in drawing the charge. Dr. Tom Davis didn't like the call. And now UNLV with a chance to lead for the first time or tie it up. Wade passes on the shot in the corner. Good. <laughs> Three-pointer. But Gary Graham better get a, a piece of chalk and make an X over there because he's hit two from the same spot. 30-29, UNLV back on top. Having overcome a nine-point deficit. Marble hit by Wade, knocked out of bounds. UNLV ball. Well, we see this, this that first three-pointer by Gary Graham has ignited this team not, uh, not only offensively but defensively. Stepped on the line. Jeff Moe stepped on the line after making the steal. Number 35, Gamble. Already in this game, UNLV has equaled the number of three-pointers they had Friday night. They've made four. Now, watch what they're looking to do. They like to get the ball into Gilliam, and then he's looking to swing it directly without putting it on the floor right to Mark Wade. Now, what happened was David Willard, after a violation, cannot take a step. He has to, just like on the court, in play, you have a pivot foot. You can fake or do something. You cannot move both feet. That's the third UNLV turnover. 29-30, and another foul. This one on David Willard, number 40. Well, he's coming out right now. Baznight will come back in. Jarvis Baznight. If you know, the problem with a game like this coaching is you, you can't wait. Too many mistakes. You've got to get somebody in there because today is the biggest game for these teams. You know, whoever wins this game, they've had a phenomenal year. Both teams will have a great year just getting to the final 16. But this is it, to get that chance to go to New Orleans. Well, one doesn't want to put a monetary tag on it either, but it's worth a million dollars to the athletic program of the school. Ooh. And in these economic uh, hard times, that is beneficial, I promise you. <laughs> Low House has tied it up. You know, Jerry Tarkanian told the press yesterday, he said, they asked him if he was going to New Orleans. He said, yeah, I'm going to New Orleans, but I just hope the team comes with me. <laughs> 
Freddie Banks. Underneath with Gary Wright. And Wright picks up the foul. That's his second. Despite all the fouls, we have no one with three so far. Number three, Gary Wright. Bakers doesn't have two. We're live at the Kingdom in Seattle, where just about what we expected has taken place. Running gun offense, 31-30 the score right now. So far, this game has been like a prize fight. You know, one team hits the other one, goes for a little spurt, bang, here comes the other team coming out in the second round and doing the same thing. No team has been able to get a hold and control the tempo of this game. Freddie Banks back at the line to shoot the second free throw of the game for UNLV. They are not a bad free throw shooting team, 71% overall. And he gets one out of two. Tied once again, just under the eight minute mark, Vern Lundquist, Bill Cunningham here from the Kingdom in Seattle. Michael Reeves across the timeline, all the way in, up and over. Oh, he had to really time that shot as Gilliam was there, and now Reeves gets the turnover. Gamble over Baz Knight and his foul. Just a strong move inside by Gamble. Kevin Gamble going strong to the middle for that shot. Now the big difference is we have seen Iowa make an adjustment defensively, and that is we see them denying the ball inside to Armin Gilliam and then trying to throw it over the top, and they're picking up the steals. Now watch Reeves penetrate all the way to the basket. Nice move. Kevin Gamble at the line trying to make it a three-point play and a five-point Iowa lead, which he's done. 7.41 to go first half, 36-31. Well, this is a Rebel team that's averaged 93 points per game and an Iowa team that's averaged 87, so our chances of seeing 200 are excellent. Underneath, turnover again. That's the fifth UNLV turnover. Bounce pass. What a dandy. Offensive foul. Does the basket count? No. How's that for taking a charge for Freddie Banks? Uh, you got to be a man in there. This is the type of game you have to do anything necessary to help your team win. You know, that is such a difficult ball for an official. You know, we were sitting right here, Vern, and had a great angle. I couldn't tell if the ball was released before the contact or after. Mark Wade, Freddie Banks along the baseline. He sneaks his way in. Marvel is fouled as he gets the rebound by Jarvis Baznight. That's the first player with three fouls. And Tark wants to talk to Mark Wade. very easily could see a high scoring game. UNLV this year has scored over 100 points 12 times and Iowa has done the same thing six times this year. For UNLV, huh. Eldridge, Hudson. Baz Knight out, Eldridge Hudson number 33. He of the knee problems for UNLV is in the lineup. Had such a promising or was such a promising player when he came to UNLV. High school legend in Southern California but has had knee problems throughout. Free throw no good. You know he's not going to waste time with that. Shot is up by Freddie Banks. Now Gary Graham, and here comes Iowa. Reeves back to low house for three. Wade, it's a two on three. <laughs> well, if you've got respiratory problems and can't breathe, this is not the place to be. Oh, boy. Graham, that's for two. Marble. For Iowa, 36-31, 6.38 to go in the first half. Now, you would have to think this is favoring Iowa, this up-and-down pace, this quick, because they do use 10 players. They had 10 players averaging oh, in double figures minutes played this year. Reach in foul, Mark Wade. UNLV foul. But, you, you know, Mark Wade looking for the steal, but you got to play defense with your feet. You know, there's Lowhouse, seven foot, out on the court. Mark Wade. Look, what, six feet tall? At least he's listed at six feet tall. Uh, reaching in, picking up a cheap foul. He's got to be aware of the, the situation. That is that they're in a penalty situation. Don't give up something easy. That's too strong. And the rebound brought down by Hudson of the running rebel. 36-31. Hasn't been a good free throw shooting first half for Iowa. Underneath, 
Armstrong dies for it. It went off Freddie Banks. It'll be Iowa. Uh, right now, the running Rebels are forcing things that are not there offensively, and this Iowa team is reacting so well to the ball. Now Lorenzen, number 44, back in the lineup of the Hawkeyes. And Gerald Patio comes back in for UNLV. B.J. Armstrong, guarded by Mark Wade. Aaron Wright. Oh! Perfectly executed. I thought for a moment that's the worst shot I'd ever seen. Now on the weak side, to set that back screen. Hudson did not help, and there was the easy dunk. UNLV is now 5 of 11 from three-point range. Whistle, another foul. Watch the alley-oop again. Now, the alley-oop, Hudson's man sets the screen, no help, and there's the lob. Perfect play. There's an athlete there, too, to go up and get the basketball the way Marble did. Those are some of the things you look to do against a team that applies a lot of pressure. You have to look for the back doors, the lobs, things of that, like that. What that eventually will do, if you have success, it loosens up the defense, and now you're able to run the things you'd like to run at the offensive end of the court. Armstrong at the line gets the first of the one and one. Brad Lowhouse getting a rest again as Dr. Tom Davis has pulled him and put Lorenzen in the game. Armstrong now one out of two. Given name is Benjamin. And we've equaled the largest lead in the first half. It's 40 to 31. 5 40 to go in the half. Mark Wade gives it off to Freddie Banks and the Las Vegas senior. Too strong. Air ball. Too strong and a bad shot, too. Armstrong. There's one thing taking a good quick shot. It's another thing when you take a quick bad shot. That's the coaching you're coming out with. Well, you know, it's something Jerry Tarkanian loves this fast pace, but he also let them know that it was, that was a bad shot. For three, Freddie Banks. Over the top, Hudson gets the foul for UNLV. That's his third in the first half. So Baz Knight and Hudson both with three, and there's the towel that finally came out. We're going to give you a look at halftime, but the ritual which surrounds the towel. And a man who plays an important role for UNLV, who hasn't gotten a lot of publicity, named Paul Biafor. That's coming up. Paul Biafor. <laughs> You'll hear about it. 40 to 31. 509 to go. Give me a hint. He played about as much basketball as I did. Ooh. Did he get cut, cut in the tenth grade? That's the same deal. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing Michael Jordan and I have in common, you know. And that's it. That's it, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was on an 11 nothing run. Mark Wade. Gets his first basket of the day. 42-33 after the five-minute mark. Chris Moe for three. Moe is averaging 11.5 points off the bench. Gets his first three of the day. Freddie Banks for three. <laughs> well, why not? Try the triple again. And Iowa gets the bounce. UNLV has already attempted 13 three-point shots. They've hit five. Timeout. The winds of change are blowing at Cadet. They've shot it before 15 seconds a lap and 38 times for UNLV. Now, you're saying quickest game ever? Uh, I can't imagine a game being any quicker. You know, it does take four seconds to get from one end of the court to the other. For some of you. <laughs> Uh-oh, they're freezing the ball. <laughs> the clock's down to 25 seconds. I knew you were going to mention the clock before the day was out, at least once. <laughs> bounce pass underneath the Dr. Tom Davis specialty, that one bounce pass in the entry, entry level. And David Ed Horton gets the basket. 47-33, a 14-point UNLV lead. Deficits don't bother the running Rebels side. Uh, I 
have a lead, I'm sorry. Rebels were down by 22 earlier in the year against Western Kentucky and came back to win the NIT preseason tournament. They were down 19 to, to New Mexico State and were able to come back at halftime. But there's one other stat. You have to remember, Iowa is undefeated, little leading at halftime. Lorenzen tries for the rebound. Marble gets it for Iowa, 47-33. B.J. Armstrong lays it off for right. Oh, how unselfish. Oh, uh, just a beautiful play by B.J. Armstrong. He knew where that man was all the time, and when he went up and left the floor, he knew what he was going to do with the ball. Another steal. Mo in the corner. UNLV has called timeout. They've got two left. And they trail 51-33. Turnovers now. Iowa 8, UNLV 6. But Iowa's converted 14 points out of those 8 turnovers. That's the big stat. Now, now the thing is, Jerry Tarkanian did not want to call a timeout now with three minutes to play, but he was forced to. He's got to regroup his team. Make sure that they don't lose their confidence at this point because when you're down 18 points with three minutes to play, you've got to stop the bleeding at some point. They would like to go. Coach Tarkanian can get his team in there. You know, 15 and under, he surely has the confidence that his ball club can come back and win. Already in the game, UNLV, 4 of 15. They've put it up 15 times. They will not stop. Look at the graphic from Friday night when they put up 23 three-pointers and hit only four. And I guess it's just the nature of the beast, so to speak. That has been their reason for success all year, and they probably won't come out of that, Bill. Oh, they won't change their style, but he's just got to make sure that they handle basketball a little better as a team. They're throwing the ball around like it's a hot potato from one side of the court to the other, trying to force things that aren't there. Now, the thing is, they've shot 41% from the three-point area all season long, so they won't change in that regard, but they just have to get under a little more under control with the basketball. Dr. Tom Davis of Iowa is in his first year having replaced George Raveling. Raveling, of course, went to USC, and Dr. Tom came from Stanford. He is trying to become only the second coach that we know of to lead a team to the Final Four in his first year in the school. Larry Brown did it his first year at UCLA in 1980, and Ed Jucker did it in Cincinnati in 1961. They went all the way and won it all, so that is what Dr. Tom Davis is trying to accomplish this afternoon. Well, Ed Horton almost missed the floor on that foul shot. <laughs> 3.09 to go first half. Let's check the lineups. Jeff Lowe is in there, number 20, with Marble, Lowhouse, Michael Reeves, and Horton for Iowa. Freddie Banks, short, that's the 16th three-pointer, Armand Gilliam, and he gets two and calms things down. Oh. You know, at some point, they have to look a little more inside to Armand Gilliam, because the only way he's getting, getting the basketball at the offensive end of the court is on the offensive glass. And Horton, two more. Horton's a man who started the first 24 games of the year, then gave way to Gary Wright. Traveling call. And that's the seventh UNLV journal. Well, that's what we're talking about, forcing something that's not there. It's fine. Even that point, Gary Graham, if he pulled up for the three-point shot, it would have been a good shot. But trying to power it inside, one against two, no chance. Low house. Whoops. the bullet he threw over. <laughs> it's a good thing that that Gamble didn't get a hand on it. Broken finger. 53-35. Mark Wade. Now there was a case where Graham was looking for that three-point shot. He should have just pulled up and shot the two-pointer. Mo goes out to get the rebound. And there was a foul on the long rebound. 
Graham is third player for the running Rebels to pick up his third foul. I am I am amazed by what we've seen the last 10 minutes. You, you, you know what? Uh, well, right there you see the field goal percentage. And they've had, for the most part, Iowa has just shot very good shots. They've moved the ball well. They've won turnovers. They've gotten the easy baskets. But I am surprised to see the score what it is. You know, I, I'm not surprised that there's 53 points on the board by Iowa. I'm just surprised that we haven't seen UNLV more effective offensively. Jeff Lowe gets the bounce in the first free throw. 20 of 26 for the field, from the field for Iowa. Horton with a rebound, goes up for two more, good block. Richard Robinson is gone, nice pass by Banks. And Patio gets the layup. Richard Robinson has come in now for UNLV. So the Run Rebels have Wade Robinson, Banks, Gilliam, and Patio. Point margin 54 37 with 138 to go at halftime. Good patience by Iowa at the offensive end. Back in for Iowa, number 10. Now here's that long outlet pass by Wade over to Banks. Outstanding offensive play there. Making that bounce pass. That is so tough to bounce a pass that far across the court and have a player be able to get control of it. BJ Armstrong back into the lineup now for Iowa. And Arn Gilliam goes to the line. Senior out of Pittsburgh. Transfer from Independence Junior College. Now what UNLV would like to have happen now is a couple more good things happen to them. They have a minute and 36 left in this half. Now if they can make a steal, or they can stop Iowa at the other end of the court, maybe get a basket, get it down to 13 or 14 points. That will be something positive going into the locker room. 127 to go. There's the lob again for Marble and Lowhouse. Guilty of the foul underneath. But but this time we see the excellent help defensively by Robinson. His man comes up and sets the screen. Lowhouse. But he reads it. He knows his teammates picked off, and he's back in there deflecting that pass. Lowhouse picks up his first foul, and Patio will go to the line. Gerald Patio in his first year at UNLV from Rain, Louisiana. Play his junior college ball at Seminole JC. Let's see if they pick him up full court, put some pressure on him. You can't pick up the silly foul if you're UNLV. 54-40. 18-point lead has been cut by four. Half Jeff Lowe. Half-court trap. Looking to keep the ball out of the middle area. They had success earlier when they ran this one time and created a turnover. Lowe gets out of the trap. Boy, they look poised out here, don't they, Iowa? Sure do. patience, this trap, they're not afraid of it. They know what they have to do. Low in the corner for Lowhouse. 18 on the shot clock, 50 seconds on the game clock. Underneath to right. What a bounce. The thing that impressed me was the patience. Yep. You know, they spread the court, they moved the basketball, they knew what they wanted to do when the clock got down to 15 seconds, look for a good shot, and that's what they got. Largest lead of the half has been 18. It's at 16 right now. UNLV has it led since it was 7 to 6. Lowhouse picks up his second quickly. Well, just who we mentioned a few minutes ago, at some point you got to look into the big guy. You know, give him the ball before he has to kick off the offensive flash. And that's what they did at that time. Make a correction, that last foul was on Gary Wright, and that is his third. The leading scorer so far, Lowhouse and Armstrong with 10. Armand Gilliam has 13 for UNLV. Lawrence West has come into the lineup now for UNLV. Where's number three? Junior out of San Diego. Well, I'm sure Iowa will look to take that last shot. They'll probably look to shoot a burn with about five seconds left on the clock. Just to make sure that UNLV does not get a possession and have a chance to score at the other end. Eldridge Hudson back into the lineup for UNLV for the final 33 seconds of the half. 
And the reason for this is Coach Tarkanian does not want those players to pick up a cheap foul here in the last 33 seconds of this half. Gamble back to Armstrong. Guess what? <laughs> Picked up the cheap foul. That's a tough position, coming off the bench, sitting over there for oh, 19 minutes, 19 and a half minutes, and coming in trying to do something positive. But what happened is West came running at Armstrong, wasn't under control. Armstrong read it and was able to pick up the cheap foul. Having picked up the foul, West goes to the bench. David Willard back in, number 40. And Armstrong is at the line. You know, I can't emphasize enough. The way these two teams play, either one has the ability to run off 20 points. And for me, you know, after this UNLV team coming out of the locker room, I would expect that they're going to come out and going to be clawing like nothing else you've seen before. They have six seniors on this ball club. This is their last chance. So they know that they have to take a deep breath in that locker room and come out with that intensity. Well, given the method of their play, 16 is not too much to overcome. Gilliam doesn't get it. Another rebound for Iowa. Iowa has already shot 23 free throws. And as the buzzer sounds, Marble tries for three. Well, it's a heck of a spurt for Iowa. That's the end of the first half with a score 58-42. CBS Sports coverage of the NCAA Basketball Championship continues after this message and a word from your local station. CBS Sports coverage of the NCAA Basketball Championship is sponsored by Quaker State Motor Oil. When car carrying people... 58 to 42. You know, yesterday, the day belonged to the Big East. Today, at least to this point, it's belonged to the Big Ten. James, everyone knows the UNLV it plays a fast-paced ball game, but their interior defense, someone should put up uh, a wake-up call in well, for those pe guys. People talk about the UNLV defense. It's strong on the perimeter, but not on the inside, and Iowa's just ramming it down there. Throws this nice pass from Gary Wright to Roy Marble, indicative of the unselfishness on the part of Iowa. Good eye communication between those two players made it happen. All right, people were wondering, can UNLV come from behind? Six times during the season, the running Rebels have trailed. They've won all six ball games, including 20 down to Western Kentucky in the NIT final, winning that game and trailing New Mexico State by 19 on the road and coming back and winning that game as well. Now the winner of this contest goes on to play Indiana. Champions today in the Midwest final. 77-76. Hoosiers coming back from 12 down with 13 minutes to go to beat the 10th seeded Tigers who put up quite a fight today. Here's some of the action. LSU making the steal. And up goes to Anthony Wilson for the jam. Bobby Knight was hit with a tee in the first half of this ball game. Almost got hit with a second one. I got a little bit excited because I didn't know whether it was a three-second violation or a foul. The guy made no indication. I thought it was extremely poor officiating. Hoosiers on the comeback. Joe Hillman. This was a key bucket. The hoop and a foul. Cut at the four. And now we'll pick a trailing one. Thomas got Vargas in the air and was short. But Powell for the offensive rebound. Brent and Billy call it. This was LSU's chance to win the game. Inside, Nikita Wilson with the buzzer. Indiana wins it. The Hoosiers go to the final four. This is what you play for, and these two hours have been the most fun I've ever been into, and, and we're just, we're very optimistic, and how about, it's great. It's how about a great feeling. Guys? A great feeling, all right, and it's a feeling that Bobby Knight will be experiencing for the fourth time in his career, James. But he may not want to see Iowa down the road. Iowa's the only team that's ever scored 100 points on a Bob. We'll get underway at 2 o'clock Eastern time. Then at 3.30 from New Orleans, the final four will be here. Game one will be Providence against Syracuse, that Big East uh, rematch, if you will. And that'll be followed by Indiana against the winner of the game you're watching, Iowa and UNLV. And then on Monday night, our championship game gets underway at 8 o'clock Eastern time. And We'll continue on the road to the Final Four in just a moment. Mazda wanted me to tell you about their brand new 4 before, but I'd rather show you. I hammered this truck for days to see for myself just how good it really is. Bottom line, best 4x4 I've ever driven, period. Another real surprise was that Mazda's loaded up SE5 4x4s priced close to the other guy's stripped down 4x4s. Now, if you ask me, 
that's worth jumping about. It's not too early to plan to attend one of the nation's most exciting sporting events. Next year, see college basketball at its best. To receive your 1988 NCAA Final Four ticket application, call 913-262-1988 during business hours or write the NCAA at 1988 Final Four Tickets, P.O. Box 1906, Mission, Kansas, 66201. Remember, call 913-262-1988 during business hours for a ticket application. Most major college referees are working about 50 games during the season, give or take a few. But three or four hours before the game is when you ready, get ready for a big game. We're not any different than the, the player or the coach. Uh, we have to get ourselves up. We have to start the concentration. We have to get ready for the big ball game. We talk about pre-game uh, preparation. We talk about things that could happen during the course of the game to uh, make sure that the game runs smoothly. Uh, once the game gets started, you know, uh, you kind of tunnel vision your, your mind and the referee in the ball game, and uh, I don't really think of anything outside of the peripheral of officiating the game. It's a tremendous mental preparation. I think in theater, when you put your costume on and you walk onto the stage and you present yourself. So true, I think, in, in officiating. This message furnished by the NCAA. In recent NCAA tournaments, there's been a tendency to regard UNLV as what they call in Vegas as a lounge act. But this year, Jerry Tarkanian has become a headliner at the tournament. Still apart from his basketball team, we know little about that school. So we dispatched our Gary Paul Gates to the desert for a look at the quiet campus in the shadow of the Neon Strip. People seem to have trouble imagining a real university in the shadow of, of, a, of the Strip. The famous Vegas Strip, a landmark that speaks for itself. This is the perception that UNLV has to live with, and the people here insist it is not their true identity. They point out that on this campus there are no garish, neon-lighted signs directing students to class. Nor is there any truth to the snide notion that at the end of freshman year, a student can play double or nothing in theater and ballet. UNLV is taking the cultural high road, and they want the rest of us to know that. A lot of our part-time instructors, for example, are trained classical musicians who play for a living on the Strip. I must confess, I have a problem with Las Vegas as a center of the arts. It was once said about something that it has as much appeal as an Ibsen festival in Las Vegas. Now, isn't that the perception? I'll tell you a convention we're having this summer that uh, sounds about as esoteric as an Ibsen festival. We have the International Double Reed Society. And in an effort to enhance its academic reputation, the school has a million-dollar endowment for scholarships to valedictorians from high schools throughout Nevada. That's what brought Susan Romero to UNLV. I felt that it's about time was my kind of attitude towards it, that they finally started rewarding students for academics rather than just sports. Of course, it was sports, namely basketball, that put UNLV on the national map. And although some of Jerry Tarkanian's recruiting methods have raised questions about his program's integrity, there is no doubt that the success of the Runnin' Rebels has been a big attraction, as we found out when we asked other students why they chose to come here. Well, it's the number one hotel school in the country, just like the number one basketball team in the country. Well, I like this school. It's, got a, it's getting a good reputation. The hotel management school here. Ah, yes, the hotel management school. That may be the biggest draw of all. UNLV's Hotel and Restaurant School ranks among the best in the country. And here the Las Vegas Strip offers the students a real-life laboratory. What we sell is a school close to a community in which the chance for work and involvement is very great. But in most Las Vegas hotels, the specialty of the house is not necessarily good food and entertainment. And to deal with all that, a very special course is required. I would venture to say that we probably are the only university in the world that has a funded chair in gaming management. That we had to see, and we later visited a class in casino management. So welcome to the world of high mathematics, Las Vegas style. What one sees when you go into the lab are the tables, but in fact we're doing management theory. We're offering a uh, course in statistics, what type of payoffs does one, does one encounter. And so UNLV, and the community it serves, offers a variety of challenges to curious young intellect. It all depends on one's personal taste and preference. Speaking only for myself, I plan to return next summer, in time to catch the action at that international Double Reed Convention.
For CBS Sports, I'm Gary Paul Gates. Gary talked about high mathematics. What is UNLV going to do to come back from 16 down? I don't expect them to change much, Jimmy. Uh, the only option they've shown on the offensive end is to shoot the ball and shoot it quickly. I think they're going to have to really try and free Armin Gilliam up a little bit more, but given their tendency to launch the ball, they can get back into the game quickly. They've only lost one time this year. Don't expect them to change much. And they've got to shut down Iowa in the interior game there. Second half's coming up next. We still have one spot. Kingdom in Seattle. There is Jerry Tarkanian now in his 14th year as head coach at UNLV. That towel has become almost as famous as Jerry. John Thompson has a towel. Bill Frieder has a towel. But there is no towel treated with quite the reverence. Then, of course, slightly tepid tap water. The temperature must be just right. The Tark wants the towel in the proper fashion excess moisture out of it and finally the taste test and Biafori says it's ready for Tarkania and hands it to him and now Tarkanian is ready to coach Paul Biafori the junior manager from Bridgeport could be a taste tester for Henry VIII well I'm sure that UNLV had heard a few words from Jerry Tarkanian at halftime. I think he waved the towel perhaps. Uh, waved a towel. He might have snapped that towel a little bit of that locker room because his team just did not play the way they normally do. But again, this team, being down 16, has the ability to come back because they pressure defensively. They look for the three-point shot. I think one thing they have to do is get the ball inside a little bit more to their man, Armin Gilliam. In the first half, Iowa 73%. UNLV only 38%. They were 4 of 17 from three-point range. Free throws, the Hawkeyes went to the line 23 times. The UNLV's eight. They scored 15, and they lead by 16. Leading scores, Gilliam with 15, and Armstrong with 12 for the Hawkeyes. And the rebounding edge not as pronounced as we might have thought, 21 to 18. Iowa has the lead. And Iowa will inbound now, seven-foot Brad Lowhouse. UNLV is 6-0 when trailing at the half. They've only lost one game, of course, and that was to Oklahoma. They were tied in that game 48-all. They were down earlier to New Mexico State by 19 at halftime and came back to win. We're underway 1958 before we determine which of these two teams joins Indiana, Providence, and Syracuse in New Orleans. Gary Wright, air ball. Marble saves it off the underside of the basket. Right off the bat, we see UNLV do something they haven't done in the last seven minutes of this basketball game, come out denying that first pass. Wade takes the shot. Low house with the rebound. Quickly up to B.J. Armstrong. Loose ball controlled by Armstrong, and alertly he gets it back to Low House. Set the lineups now. Armstrong joined by Low House, Gary Wright, Kevin Gamble, and Roy Marble for Iowa. And for UNLV, Baz Knight and Banks join Armin Gilliam, Mark Wade, and Gerald Patio. So the starting quintets for both teams are on the court now. Right now, defensively, UNLV is switching on everything. When the screens are set on the baseline, they're looking to step out and switch. Five seconds left on the 45-second clock. First time we've had to mention it today. The shot too strong, rebound, running Rebels. One thing, Iowa's got to keep playing their game, and that's shooting the ball a little quicker. Armin Gilliam gets the first basket of the second half. One thing they have to guard against Iowa is being tentative. Turnover. Substitution quickly. Dr. Tom Davis goes to his bench and brings Ed Horton in to settle down Gary Wright. It was Wright who took the quick shot. Mark Wade comes across the timeline, 14 point lead. You can see that UNLV team standing on the sidelines. Patio continues his cold streak, tries for three. Gamble back to B.J. Armstrong, gets it. Number 10, B.J. Armstrong. Here's Wade, all the way. Offensive foul on Mark Wade. Third. Now we see the defense back. B.J. Armstrong.
strong back there, has that position. Mark Wade was determined to take it to the hole. Man for man pressure. Applied by UNLV. They've done, oh boy. Lowhouse took the charge. Mark Wade hurt a shoulder. UNLV foul, charge two. And the foul is on Mark Wade. That's his fourth. As Lowhouse stood and took the pick. Now, watch this. Now, this is Bass Knight's fault, not letting his teammate Wade know that screen was there. He has to be up close to his man so he can communicate. And that's the fourth foul now on Mark Wade, and that really hurts this UNLV team. Wade, the all-time assist leader in NCAA basketball, had five in the first half, goes to the bench with four fouls. Place taken by Gary Graham, who's playing with three. Good bounce pass in the paint again. And the shot is up and good. Gamble gets the basket. Well, Jerry Jarkanian said Mark Wade is the heart and soul of our ball club. Here's Banks, hits the three-pointer. He's got to get on a roll. Graham's got to pick up that slack with Mark Wade out of the ball game. There's a foul on Graham, and it wasn't called. Lauren Marbles. Screen from Horton goes on the baseline. Out of bounds to be inbounded by Iowa. Now, one big concern of Tom Davis is coming into this game. He was concerned with, he felt that UNLV's defense, they would hand check that they would get a hand on the hip of his players and really hurt them deep offensively and not allow them a lot of freedom. UNLV in serious foul trouble. Wade with four. Baznight, Graham, and Hudson with three. Michael Reeves is in. Armstrong is out. That shot short. Foul call. Now, what I want you to watch is watch Banks on the baseline coming over and giving that good defensive help, stepping in there and reaching in and knocking it loose. one on Iowa. Here's Graham. Puts up the short jumper, and it's short. Rebound into the arms of Ed Horton. Well, after Graham hit those two three-pointers in the first half, he's become tentative. He's short on that jump shot. He didn't do it. He was trying to aim it instead of shoot the basketball. Now we see this Iowa team using more of the clock, showing more patience offensively, running their set offense. Cute little bounce pass inside. Back it comes to Lowhouse. That's no accident. That's something Tom Davis teaches. That bounce pass, which is so difficult to defend against. Seven on the shot clock. Gamble takes it, top of the key, and hits it. Boy, is he having himself a tournament. Be fun to watch and see now if Iowa uses that shot as much each time down. That's the three-point shot. Horton, good rebound. And quickly, here come the Hawkeyes. They've got a three on two. Armstrong, Gamble, running hook, offensive foul. Substitution for Iowa. Well, that's one of the problems when you shoot that long, quick three-pointer. What happens is there's usually a long rebound. Your offensive men are not in good position to get to the offensive boards or get back defensively. And we saw that time there was a three-on-two, nearly a four-on-two fast break. Jeff Moe comes into the lineup for the Hawkeyes, number 20. Michael Reeves is also in there. Gamble, Horton, Al Lorenzen has come into the lineup now. So the second unit for the most part, with the exception of Kevin Gamble in Brian. Pass underneath, jumper taken, good. Armin Gilliam gets two more. Yep. 19. And, and the thing is, now we don't see Iowa coming back and double teaming on Armin Gilliam, so you have to look inside to the big guy. Safely across the timeline, a 15-point Iowa lead, 64-49. Horton, they'll come back and reload. Excellent patience offensively. They look, give Lorenzo a look see down to the baseline. Traveling. That's 13 turnovers for Iowa in the game. Rebounds of four-point edge for Iowa. They are among the nation's leaders in rebounding margin, almost 13 per game. Good pressure defensively by the Hawkeyes. 64, 49, 15, 25 to go in the game. The winner here in Seattle meets Indiana in New Orleans next Saturday afternoon.
Now Iowa's back into their 1-2-2 two, two zone. What they'll do on the wings, they'll extend it a little bit in the direction of Banks. Concerned with that three-point shot. Patio for three. Finally got one. <laughs> he probably said, thank the Lord. I never thought I'd score one of those. Gerald Patio cuts the margin to 12. Underneath the gamble. Offensive foul. Two big plays by Gerald Patio. Dead ball timeout. Four fouls on Kevin Gamble. He's picked up two in this half. How to start an impressive family art collection. First, find some talented local artists. Then inspire them with Crayola Happy Meal boxes from McDonald's. Every Crayola Happy Meal comes with your children's favorite McDonald's foods, plus an art kit with a McDonald's land stencil and four Crayola crayons or a Crayola marker. There are four sets in all, a different Yes, ones. an all Big E semifinal Providence against Syracuse in game one. And the winner of this game takes on Indiana in game two. Watch two big plays by Gerald Patio. First, the jump shot for three points, Bill Cunningham. Well, he needed a hand in his face at the offensive end of the court, and he makes the big defensive play, drawing the fourth foul on Kevin Gamble inside, and that's a big play because he's the leader of this ball club. It was a 16-point Iowa halftime lead. It's now at 12 with 14.54 to go. Gary Graham... Now, one thing this does, with Gary Graham in there, they have three players that can shoot that shot right there. The three-pointer in Patio, Banks, and Graham. Here's Banks' turn. Yeah, got it. In single digits, they've got it down to nine. So that fourth foul on Wade might work out to be a benefit for this UNLV team. Because he's not a shooter. That's right, and now they have the shooter. Look at the defense. The crowd is in the game now, too. Jeff Lowe, number 20. Back to Armstrong, says calm down. Nice presence on the court by B.J. Armstrong. Yeah, I just wonder if they're just using a little too much patience. You love to see a team patient, but the rhythm that they were in in the first half was just outstanding. There's Marble, free underneath. He took one too many. why you might see a timeout very quickly by Tom Davis and not allow this to get any closer. Now they're battling for that loose ball. And there's the foul. Now Iowa has 14 fouls now. And UNLV too. That foul on Al Lorenzen, number 44, the junior. And UNLV. Three-point field goal, 7 of 21. We'll see them try to inbound the pass to Gilliam, but they're trying to deny it to him. There's the trap. Here comes the steal by Armstrong, but Gilliam forces it away. The hammer. Banks for three. No. Patio. Oops. No, he got fouled on that shot by Jeff Moe. That could have been a four-point play. is where leadership is a factor. And right now, the two leaders of this Iowa ball club are on the bench. That's Brad Lowhouse right there in your screen and Kevin Gamble sitting right next to him. So I would think that the one guy that's got to do this for this ball club is B.J. Armstrong. Well, here comes Lowhouse back in the ball game. In for the Hawkeyes, 54, Brad Lowhouse. Now Lorenzen will head to the bench. And Freddie Banks, first... Las Vegas native to ever star for UNLV. Went to high school in Vegas. Gets the free throw. That cuts it to eight. UNLV outscoring Iowa by eight in this half. Make it nine. You know, one thing I want to say, if you're the number one team in the country, 
you've worked very hard to get there. And you're not going to just roll over and die when you're down or things aren't going your way. You have to have a lot of character and a lot of heart and a heck of a coach in Jerry Carpenter. Foul trouble. Again, hits UNLV. That's Gary Graham. And that's his fourth. Graham's fourth. Mark Wade, who's playing with four, comes back in for Graham, who leaves with four. Now, a couple things. They have two guards. Now, we see Wade and Graham with those four fouls. They cannot back off and not, they have to play smart basketball, not pick up the chief foul, but they have to be aggressive out there, especially at the defensive end. Roy Marble, the sophomore, Lowhouse, the senior. What I was running now is a flex offense. They're screening across the lane and screening down. Marble again too strong. Lowhouse puts it up off the glass and gets it. There's the senior coming through with a big boost. Now he immediately turns and guards the inbound play, but Gilliam takes it for UNLV. 66-57 with 13 minutes to go in the ball game. As CBS's coverage of the road to New Orleans concludes this afternoon, after this it's all in New Orleans. Now we see them backing off Mark Wade. They'll extend that defense, that 1-2-2 two, two defense, when it, the ball's in Patio's hands or Banks. That's where it's got to go. Gilliam's got 21. 66-59, 12 30 to go in the game. Armstrong harassed in the backcourt, gets it to Lowhouse. Now, it wouldn't be a bad idea when they do force B.J. Armstrong to give it up in the backcourt that way. Don't let him get it back because he starts the offense for this Iowa team. Marvel's got it now. Now Armstrong looks underneath for Gary Wright, settles to low on the baseline. 15 on the shot clock. Roy Marvel, jumper is short, air ball. Eldridge Hudson with the rebound. Mark Wade, they back away from him. Patio takes it and hits it. Oh, here we go. The lead is four. Now that's a rush shot. They've been trying to have patience and then the quick shot by Armstrong. Wade in the corner. Hello. Oh, I thought that one was in. They'll reload. turnover like that. I wonder where she bought that hair. 66-62, 11-20. I don't think she's from Iowa. Foul trouble. Graham and Wade with four. Gamble has four. Right and low three for Iowa. Bass, right and Hudson with three for the Hawkeyes. Law pass, low house. Good defensive play by the Rebels. He's really having a tough second half. 
Yeah, he sure is. He's competitive. He has, when you get the ball in that position, just take it to the basket strong. You don't need to make all those head fakes. And we see a big difference in that first half where Iowa was, was able to get to the foul line, what, 23 times? Right. They haven't been there very often here in the second half. Mark Wade, the senior from San, from California, from the corner for three. That is the first UNLV lead since they led seven to six. 21 to two run. Substitution for Iowa. Kevin Gamble with four fouls, replacing Bill Jones. That knocked out of bounds by UNLV. The Iowa bench in shock, and the UNLV bench all standing. Every one of them. <laughs> there isn't one seat being occupied on the UNLV bench. 21-2 Iowa run, or rather UNLV run, since the 16-minute mark. Underneath, Marble tried the one punt too many. And there's the hammer for blocking that shot. He did not go for the fake. He waited for, Mar for Marble to commit himself offensively. From the corner for three. Rebound, Gary Wright of the Hawkeyes. 68-66, UNLV lead. If you don't think this game is a head game, more than physical, the example is Patio looking for that three-pointer now instead of trying to avoid the three-pointer. Now watch this defense looking to deny the inbound pass. That's just great hustle right there defensively. Low house gets it out to Mo. Gamble in the corner. Guarded by Gerald Patio. Someone's got to step forward for this Iowa team to get him back. Mo short with a shot. Baseball pass. Patio. Offensive foul. Basket will not count. Good call by the official. a look of bemusement on Jerry Tarkanian's face. 68-66 under the nine-minute mark. It's just amazing how this game is swung. We're, we're looking at two different teams. We saw a great Iowa team the first half, and now we're seeing a great UNLV team. And you can see why they were both number one in the country during the course of this season. Lowhouse loses it. 16 Iowa turnovers. Someone on Iowa, I have to repeat it again, has got to instill some confidence. And it's not Tom Davis, it's one of the players on the court have to do that. Change for the Rebels, re-entering his 44 best night. Oftentimes, as Bazna comes into the lineup now, and Armand Gilliam gets a rest. That last foul on Brad Lowhouse is second. Armand Gilliam on the bench now with 21 points. And he gets a rest at the 841. He won't be there very long. No, sir. UNLV trail by 16 at the half. They lead by two now with eight and a half to go. Now Kevin Gamble's back with four fouls. Thanks. It's amazing the confidence of this team. Armstrong quiets the UNLV crowd for the moment. That was a big hoop for them. But the thing that's so impressive about UNLV is their confidence. You know, you would think that you'd come out in the second half and start thinking a little bit about that three-point shot. Be a little tentative. But these guys are just firing away. They've been playing all, all year this way, and they're going to keep doing it. Rebound doesn't go. Look at the aggressiveness of by the Rebels. Well, they're just a quicker team. They're just reacting to the ball. Iowa is standing. They can't get themselves up on their toes defensively. Underneath. Wade, Baz Knight controls off the glass and in. Tough ticket here in Seattle for this Western Regional Final.
These four kids came up from Las Vegas. I don't think they paid scalpers tickets for their seats. <laughs> I think they would have been closer if they just watched it from Vegas. Look at that. Jerry Tarkanian at halftime. His team trailed by 16. You know him well. Now, was he aggressive in his halftime approach? Oh, I'm sure he was. You know, Jerry Tarkanian, you don't become the defensive team like he has without being a very demanding coach. And this guy, I love him as a person. He is truly, if you ever needed a friend and you had problems, he'd be the guy. But whatever he said to that team at halftime, he, I hope he taped it because he could sell cassettes to a lot of other coaches. Current streak is 26 to 4, UNLV, and a foul on Horton. It's one on one. We're going to the other end. We're live from the Kingdom in Seattle, where we have seen two separate basketball games, it seems. The Iowa Hawkeyes roared out to a 16 point lead under the leadership of Dr. Tom Davis at the half, 58 42. But they're hitting less than 30% in the second half. And the UNLV Rebels ranked number one in the country and the top seed in the Western region have outscored Iowa 31-10 to this point in the half. Winner of this game goes up against Indiana in the second game from New Orleans next Saturday. Those running Rebel fans better not start celebrating now because this Iowa team, you know, they've been in close games all through this tournament. And these guys aren't going to roll over. They had a 19-0 run in their last ball game against Oklahoma. So don't be surprised to see these guys get it going at the defensive end. This Iowa team was down by 22 in Champaign, Illinois, against the Illini and came back to win. Rebound taken down by UNLV, 74-68 at the seven-minute mark. This Armin Gilliam is truly an impressive basketball player. I mean, he just helps this team. I, I just love how patient he is. You know, he shot over 60% from the field, and he's an inside player. You could expect him to possibly be frustrated not getting the ball as much as he did there with all the three-point shots that they take. He's got 23 in the game today. That equals his season average at 38 in the semifinal win the other night. Ed Horton, number 25, Roy Marble. Boy, the shots are not falling for Marble in this half. Now watch Gilliam seal off and have that great position with the defensive man's top side. He just turns and goes up for that jump shot. Fifteen foul now on UNLV. Roy Marble at the line. Now this could be a turning point for Iowa. If he makes the foul shots and they're able to apply that good defensive pressure with their trap and create a turnover, it could turn things that quickly in this ballgame. That cuts the lead to six. In the backcourt. UNLV quickly across the timeline. Freddie Banks. Lorenzen rebound. Here come the Hawkeyes on the run. Kevin Gamble. Rebound taken down by Patio. That's still a good shot Kevin Gamble had. He's got to look for that shot. Now the thing is, now UNLV cannot become passive at the offensive end of the court. They have to keep playing their game. Look inside to the big guy. If they have the good three-pointer, go up and shoot it. We have a lot of time in this game. Pretty good foul shooter, shooting 73% from the foul line. That alone has been such a drastic difference as in halves, Billy. 23 times to the foul line for Iowa in the first half, only eight for UNLV. Reasons that happens. Number one, you're not getting the ball inside and being able to power to the best. We've seen Marvel with the ball inside several times, but pump banking, making moves, trying to avoid the contact almost instead of drawing the fouls. Now we see the UNLV team now looking inside to the big guy. And Gilliam going after his 25th point of the game. And it's an eight-point Rebel lead, 5.40 to go in the game. UNLV trying to get back into the Final Four for the first time since 1977 when they lost to North Carolina in the semifinal game by one point. Iowa was down 
against Oklahoma. Five points with about a minute and 30 to play and ended up winning that game. Nice play inside. Roy Marble gets to it at the 5.20 mark. And it's a six-point margin again, favoring the Rebels. UNLV trails the half, 58-42. is Patio didn't even look at the basket that time. They're trying to milk the clock. You cannot, when you have the good shot, you still got to look for it. Timeouts, two for each team. UNLV, seven fouls, Iowa with five. And we're five minutes away from determining the final piece of the puzzle. Gilliam goes for the steal and drew the foul. That's three fouls on Armin Gilliam. This is not a big UNLV team. The biggest player on the court right now, Fast Knight, is listed at 6'9", six, six, and I guarantee you, if he's lucky, if he's 6'7 and a half. Lock pass, gamble, out of position, but got the shot. Oh, it's what there was, and they recognized it, a mismatch. Wade trying to contest gamble, and he just took it strong. Largest lead for UNLV was eight, now at four, 434 to go in the game. For three, Freddie Banks. Gamble way up to the rebound, and Horton gives him some help. Underneath, Armstrong. Blocking foul. Now the game is changing again. Now we see, all of a sudden, Iowa is the aggressive team. At some point, you'd like to see both teams become aggressive. Now we see the mismatch, and here's the law of going to Kevin Gamble inside. Nothing Mark Wade could do. Smart play not picking up the foul. That would have been his fifth. Armin Gilliam was called for the foul, and that's his fourth. Time has been called. We've got 4.20 to go in the ballgame. Team to arrive in New Orleans or to earn the right to play there being determined here in Seattle in the Kingdom before a crowd of 22,900 this afternoon. Already one semifinal and all Big East encounter as Providence will take on Syracuse in the first game next Saturday afternoon. And Indiana earned the right to take on the winner of this game with a one-point victory earlier this afternoon over LSU. 21 to go in this game, and Roy Marvel at the line. Now, I'll be interested to see if UNLV, if, if Marvel makes this foul shot, will look to attack the trap, maybe looking for the three-pointer, or are they going to just hold it back and look to run their offense? Well, Iowa just backs off. It's that theory that Tom Davis has one pass, and back off the track. If they can't make the steal or create a turnover, they get back into their either man-to-man -man defense, which they're playing now with their 1-2-2. Two, two. They're packed down around Gilliam. Now Gamble comes out to contest Wade just a little bit. Shot clock has 20 seconds left. 78-75, 350 to go in the game. Now this is a break with Wade on the court. Kevin Gamble with four, four fouls. He can just back off, make sure that he doesn't pick up any silly fouls. There's a lot of the Baz Knight underneath him. Good. But that's one of the problems when you back off. You allow a passer, a young man that's broken an NCAA record for, for assists, to make that wide open pass. Jarvis Baz Knight goes for the steal and gets called for the foul. Now watch Baz Knight with the lob from Wade. Gets that foul. Gets, excuse me, scores the two, and we'll see him picking up the foul right there, trying to trying to deny the ball to right. That's four fouls on Baz Knight. So there are four UNLV players with four. And Gary Wright at the line, where he's hitting 50% of his free throws, and gets a huge one. Players 
Bears would like to run away. They don't want that type of pressure. But Armin Gilliam, he wants it. Gilliam's got 27. And even three minutes between one of these teams and the date with Indiana and New Orleans. Surprising Iowa just holding the ball out here. They've got to get themselves into something offensively. At this point, this is helping this UNLV team. Armstrong short with a three-point shot and Mark Wade with the rebound. For a couple reasons, we have several UNLV players with four fouls. They're not being aggressive, standing on the perimeter. I didn't understand that series. Mark Wade came across the timeline dribbling the ball with a huge grin on his face. Almost like we got him. 82-76, 2.15 to go in the game. Banks, the senior, taken down by Armstrong. It's three on two. Armstrong all the way up and in. Four-point lead. Entering for Iowa, 25 and Horton. For the Rebels, 32, Gary Graham. Gary Graham coming back into the lineup for UNLV, and Ed Horton comes into the contest for the Iowa Hawkeyes. 2.05 remaining. Four players with four fouls for UNLV. Gamble has played much of the second half with four for Iowa. Well, one good thing now, UNLV has gone to their three-guard offense, and it appears they're going to hold the ball, spread the court a little bit, and now they have three guards that can handle that basketball. problem that Iowa has putting on putting any pressure oh what a steal that was Lowhouse with the steal Marble has it taken away look at look at the expression on Wade after he took it he's just having a ball out there smiling laughing Mark Wade started his collegiate career at Oklahoma didn't get to play much transferred to El Camino Junior College and now in his last season at UNLV and 68 seconds now 65 now, oh they did take that foul that's not the man you want to foul an 80% foul shooter fearless Freddie Banks now here's the steal look at this completely extends his body to make that steal now what's the position Marble turns and before he can do anything Wade just picks his pocket and look at Wade Grimm. <laughs> Iowa has called timeout. They've got the last four years. The Western Regional Champion has gone on to win the NCAA title. Jimmy Valvano's Miracle Team in 83. John Thompson's Georgetown Team in 84. Rolly Massimino's Villanova Team won the 85 championship. And last year it was Denny Crum's Louisville Team, which rolled out of the West and into the NCAA championship in Dallas. Will it be the Iowa Hawkeyes or will it be the UNLV running Rebels? UNLV with only one defeat for the season. Earlier this year, as we said, overcame a 19-point deficit, but New Mexico State is not quite the caliber of Iowa. This time they overcame a 16-point deficit at halftime and they lead by four right now, make it still four. Armstrong pushes it up, low house. Need a quick basket. Moe is not in the game. He's the most prolific three-point shooter. Armstrong can't put it up for three. Gamble won the game the other night with a three-pointer. We see UNLV in the little zone right now, trying to make sure that they shoot it from the perimeter and don't get it inside. Gamble finally takes the three-point shot. Well, that theory works, at least for Iowa. 82-81. the steal. Ten second violation. Rebels did not get the ball over the center line in ten seconds. Uh, 
happened right there is that Graham was not aware of the, not even thinking about that 10 second violation instead of getting it over that mid court line and then looking to hold the ball. After we wrap things up here on CBS Sports on a Sunday afternoon, coming up tonight, 60 Minutes, followed by Murder, She Wrote, starring Angela Lansbury, and the CBS Sunday movie, Deadly Care, starring Cheryl Ladd, Ladd in a drama based on fact concerning a critical care nurse whose life spirals downward when she begins to abuse drugs and alcohol. That's coming up tonight on CBS. 22 seconds separate one of these two teams from a berth in the final four. And the Iowa Hawkeyes have the ball. The emotional ups and downs for both coaches today. And the, the thing is, both of these guys have been able to keep their teams in this basketball game. And I think that's such a great compliment for both of them because we saw in the first half, UNLV just could have folded their tent up and gone home. Now we see Tom Davis had the ability to regroup this ball club and have them in a position where they can win this ball game with 22 seconds left to play. If you're Tom Davis, who do you want taking that last shot? Well, I, I'd have to go to Gamble. I'd try to get him the basketball, but it might be a situation where I might not have a choice. And we know that B.J. Armstrong hit that big three-pointer in the last ball game against Iowa. I wouldn't be afraid of him shooting the basketball, or I'd want to go to one of my seniors. Lowhouse, Gamble, Armstrong, Marble, and Horton, the five on the floor for Iowa. Now, UNLV is showing a 2-3 zone. Lob pass. Thrown away. They tried to get it to Lowhouse. Nevada Las Vegas calls timeout. UNLV calls timeout. Both teams have used all of their timeouts. UNLV has the ball and the one-point lead. I remember my... You know, you fans, if you're wondering why Kevin Gamble threw that ball away, look underneath the hoop on the left part of your screen where Brad Lowhouse is wide open for this lob if it was there. That was an excellent play by Tom Davis coming out of that timeout. He had them prepared either for a man-to-man -man defense or if they went to that 2-3 zone. But we got a lot of time left with 14 seconds left. Gary Graham has returned for UNLV. 14 seconds remaining. UNLV has the ball in the lead in the backcourt. They better Graham. foul. Foul by Marble. 10 seconds to go. Not called an intentional foul. He'll shoot one and one. Looked like a cross body block. Sure did. Well, they fouled the guy that Jerry Tarkanian would like to be on the foul line, shooting 85% from the foul line. But I'll tell you what, he's never been in this situation. <laughs> and he's never been to the line today. Graham, one of a group of six seniors. We'll see if his nerves get to him on this foul shot. And usually you see that turn when a player shoots the ball short. And it barely hits the front rim. One and one. All net. Now a tendency of a player at this point after making that foul shot is to relax a little bit too much and lose his concentration. three-point shot. Watch for Jeff Bowe. He's on the left-hand side. Got the ball. Tried to get it. It'll be Iowa's ball. Right now, if I was Jerry Tarkanian, I would take my five players and station them outside of the three-point line around the perimeter, forcing a layup. Don't let him shoot the three-point shot. Gamble. No. Rebels win.
needs a big one against uh, uh, Oklahoma. There's the reaction. Jerry Tarkanian has been coaching for 26 years in junior college and college, and this was his 700th career victory. Let's go to Jim Nance in New York. All right, Vern, and UNLV going back to the Final Four exactly 10 years after being there in 1977. The Chevy MVPs, B.J. Armstrong for Iowa and Armand Gilliam for UNLV. Here are the four teams heading to New Orleans, Providence, Syracuse, UNLV, and Indiana. UNLV and Indiana, number one seeds advancing today. Seventh straight year that precisely two number one teams advance on. Let's go to Brenton Billy in Cincinnati for their thoughts. So the stage is set, and Billy Packer, my question to you is, can the Final Four be as exciting as the regional finals we've had the last two I days? would hope not. I, <laughs> I, I'll tell you, the two games today were just absolutely incredible. A great comeback by two teams. I never thought that uh, Vegas could come back. As a matter of fact, with the Indiana assistant coaches left here, they were ready to start looking at that Iowa film all over again. So tremendous comeback. Now, game one down in New Orleans is going to be a rematch of the Providence-Syracuse confrontation in the Big East. Syracuse won twice. Indiana then goes against UNLV. And, Billy, a quick thought on that game. I'd like to see them reseed the teams. Let the one play the seven. Let the two play the one. And I think that would be a lot better way to do it. Okay. <laughs> so we have got the final four coming up on Saturday. Let's send you back to Jim Nance. Jim? And again, the largest lead in that ball game for UNLV or for Iowa was 19 points, and the running Rebels stayed with the game plan of the second half, Gene. Really kind of interesting. Yesterday, we saw a Providence team that was quite effective in changing their philosophy from one night to the next. Today, no change in game plan from UNLV. They stayed with what got them there. All right, let's get back out to Seattle quickly for some post-game interviews with the winning running Rebels. Okay, it's joyous here, as you can imagine. Jerry Tarkanian, you're down by 16 at the half. Bill and I both alluded back to the New Mexico game, but this this wasn't quite the same circumstance. This was extraordinary. Well, you know, I, it, the first half, I had the team all screwed up. We were trying to switch certain screens and stay on certain screens, and consequently, we, were, we had no defensive pressure whatsoever. The second half, we came out and played away to Rebels like to play we just got after them and we're a much better team when we just get after people billy coach what did you tell them at halftime it, it, you got to sell the cassette well we told them i'm all through switching we're just going to go after them everybody's going to just climb right into them and we're just going to battle them all away and that's the way we play the best you know I, our kids are incredible we we missed all those open shots and if we don't hit them i know everybody's going to say you die by the outside shot but the outside shot got us here so we kept